The executive panel is something that we look very forward to because this is an opportunity. I mean, you saw Dr. Tasha Yurik, you saw Vince Molinaro, you saw um, Welby Altidore. You know, these are best-selling authors, but how do we really actually put this to work? How do we make this happen within our organizations? And so the executive panel is that opportunity for you to eavesdrop in on a conversation today between three executives, and I'll have the pleasure of uh, asking them a number of questions that we thought about before we came today to really connect in with what you'd like to know. Uh, and in order to uh, help you understand who they are, currently the COO and Executive Vice President, Mobile and Enterprise Solutions at Samsung Canada, Paul Brennan is responsible for the overall business within Samsung Canada, which includes sales and marketing teams, customer service and logistics within the organization. With 25 years of experience in the wireless and IT industry, Paul definitely has a long-term relationship with technology, including having worked in tech when dial-up was coming up. All these traits and experience have helped define his leadership and the leader that he is today. Also on the stage will be a president of ADP Canada, Holger Korman, who is leading the strategic vision and execution of ADP Canada's business plan to position ADP as a leader in the human capital management space and as a partner of choice in the human resources technology and outsourcing markets. Holger joined ADP in December 2015, bringing with him two decades of experience and leadership in the information technology and outsourcing industries in North America and Europe. And also Andre Valaquet, who uh, is currently holding the position of Vice President, Central East Sales of the Commercial Division of Dell EMC Canada. Over the past 25 plus years, Andre has touched various parts of the direct and indirect IT industry, from his involvement in Dell Canada's strategy and go-to-market transformation efforts, and now Dell EMC Canada, through to his demand generation efforts in driving solutions. Please join me in welcoming our executive panel to the stage. Thank you, gentlemen. And so as you get comfortable, take a look out uh, at your audience and we'll see uh, where your fans reside today. Holger, I'm gonna start with you as the water hits the floor. Uh, what can you do? Um, how are you measuring leadership and are there specific leadership measures that you actually use? Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, say thank you for joining the Feature Act, and this is clearly the Feature Act, right? I guess between Joe Biden, Michelle Obama down the road, there's nothing better than seeing uh, you know, three old corporate men with brown shoes. So <laughs> thank you for, for having us. We, we, didn't, uh, we didn't script that. But uh, yeah, how do you measure uh, leadership? I, I, it's hard to do. That's just my point of view. Let me start by saying um, what you can measure, and I do believe you can measure a followership according to my 13 year old daughter she measures followership and the number of Instagram clicks she has that's how she measures followership and and uh, interestingly enough that's how we became used to over social media to, to just measure followership so measuring followership is relatively easy in a world of social media just counting the clicks and bragging about it that's what my daughter does all day long um, in terms of leadership, it's a little, little harder, right? Because I, my, my view is that there is a, about a million way to lead. I, I really believe that there's not it's just one size fits all, and it is almost uh, harder to describe what it is versus what it is not. And uh, so if there's a million different ways to successful leadership, um, how do you measure that? And, and that, is, that is really, really hard. So I, I always try to stay miles away from giving prescriptive and distinct advice on how, how to lead. What we do do is um, at ADP, we, we look at engagement as a really, really important factor. And, and I hope many of you have experience with that. But there, are, there can something to be said about uh, if your employees are engaged, the odds are they kind of like it, right? When you ask sincere questions on, uh, you know, is this an inspiring place to work? Do we give you the tools to be successful? And if the answer to that is, yes, it is, the odds are they're engaged. So you can measure engagement as a factor of leadership. And then a step further, um, we go as far as asking uh, specifically, not just, you know, the guys which run the company, how do you agree with their vision and their leadership and the tools, but we ask very specifically on, uh, 
that guy? How, how do you feel about him as a leader? And does he really care? And is he really involved? And does he really help you personally? And, and that, a score comes back. And so we have those two scores. We look at engagement and we look at, um, we look at particularly the, 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 the leadership compass results. And, and we believe that allows us to at least have a rough estimate on, uh, on, on leadership. So how many um, questions are these, these women and men being asked uh, about uh, at ADP? So when they're, when they're being evaluated on this, is it five questions? Is it 100 questions? We talked about 360 with Dr. Tasha Yurik before lunch. Uh, how many questions are they being evaluated on? No, it's a great, it's a great question. So the leadership is a, uh, it's 13 questions. It's okay. very simple, all email based, nothing fancy to it, but it's really effective. So that's 13, and then engagement is a little deeper. It's about uh, 40 or so questions. Fantastic. And then how are the managers or the leaders held accountable to those results or scores? Accountable, they are discussed. You get exposure to them. They are typically not um, publicly uh, published or, or visible, but you are supposed to uh, discuss it with your manager and, and your direct reports and, and see if there are areas of improvement. So it's a, it's a very popular uh, tool, actually, because it is not singular, right? We're not just looking at the leadership results. We're look, looking at actual results. And, mm. and blending those together gives you a good indication on uh, how, what success looks like. Wonderful, thank you, thank you for that. Um, you know, aside from scores themselves, Andre, you know, can you walk us through an event that had a tremendous impact on you as a leader? And why and how did it impact you? Well, um, Bill, I, th I think I'll have to go back a little bit when I was much younger. Um, I, I'm the son of a diplomat and lived overseas and worked in a, in a few different countries. And uh, I remember the very first instance where uh, this was a Canadian project, uh, really one of the big exports from an industry is hydroelectricity and working on a Canadian compound. And you're 18 years old and just like Vince was talking about, the sense of you know, sort of taking on the world. And at the same time, I, in parallel, I had this, what am I doing here? I can't believe they hired me kind of sense. And, and one of the tasks that I had to do was around payroll and uh, delivering um, you know, the daily pay wages for the temporary workers. We had an incident where um, one of the employee's safety was threatened and had to let somebody go. At 18 years old, you learn a lesson, very valuable. There's nothing in terms of infrastructure around employee uh, benefits, equity, all those kinds of things. And to be able to take initiative where initiative didn't exist, ha not have a manual, n no blueprint, um, and to have to go through that at 18 years old, it, it sort of defined a type of leader that I would eventually become. I didn't necessarily learn that lesson until I reflected on that experience. And you fast forward to a few years ago where Canada was a pilot country uh, within, you know, then Dell, now Dell EMC, but then Dell, to uh, really reorganize the coverage model and, and transform the way that the resources were being utilized and how we helped customers solve technology problems. And in that process, we engaged with employees, we engaged with uh, customers, we engaged with uh, outside consultants, and we came up with a plan on how to go about our transformation. Well, guess what? Nothing ever goes exactly as planned, and mistakes, we make mistakes. And you know, the ability to understand where leadership has to step in and adjust for those mistakes, and be able to adapt, it was very similar to sort of experience that I had when I was younger around that adaptability and that that sort of need to identify situations where you need to take on initiative and you need to adapt quickly and make change knowing that a plan's going sideways. Wow, and so speaking of technology, Paul is with us from Samsung. I'm gonna go there. Paul, after leading the company through one of the most challenging crises in its brand history, what are some of the key lessons that you've learned? Uh, Bill, it's the first time I've ever had that question. <laughs> I'm sure it is. I'm <laughs> not. I need to reflect for a few moments before <laughs> I, I answer it. it. Um, so clearly you're uh, referring to the Note 7. And, and 2016 uh, was, was the most challenging year for Samsung and, and frankly for me personally. Um, and I think the way we tackled it as a company is we led, uh, we had our first meeting. This all happened on a weekend. And we came into the office Monday morning at 9 o'clock, and we, have a, we had a war room, which we set up. We met twice a day. But as a team, we sat there across the entire organization, from customer service to sales to marketing to PR to government relations. And, and we, as a team, thought the most important thing was to put the consumer first. 
So whatever decision we made as we went down this path, we had the consumer at the front of that conversation. So as you can well imagine, there was some spirited debate inside the organization. The finance people very concerned about cost. The PR people very concerned about how this would manifest into our reputation. But as a team, the most rewarding thing is how we galvanized across this thing. And we met every day, twice a day, uh, up until uh, almost October, December timeframe. And uh, we overcame this. And, and we overcame it. And, and as a result, it impacted our company positively. People always ask me, how did it impact me personally? And I think, for me, it, it caused me to become a better leader. Because I'd like to say that inside of my office, I have a playbook on recalls. Uh, not only one recall, but two recalls on the same product. I don't have that playbook. And we made a lot of decisions that were gut decisions that were some were right and some were wrong. But the good thing is as a leader, knowing that you can respond and re-vector to a bad decision was the one thing that I took away from it. The other thing I, I tried to inject into it, because it was a fairly stressful time, is we tried to inject a little bit of humor into it. So they, they now nicknamed me the bucket man because we'd have conversations about there was 22,000 devices in the Canadian marketplace, and I kept on telling people, break it down into small buckets. I can't resolve everything at once, let's break it down into small buckets. So even this morning, I was in a meeting and I referred to buckets, and somebody was in the meeting, started to laugh at me, calling me bucket man, but uh, it was a, a challenging time. The, the good thing about it is, if you look at our results, we actually went up a spot in our brand studies, so we're actually uh, number six, we were number seven. And the reason we actually went up is how people looked at how we handled this crisis and lived through it. Our employee engagement scores, as you talked about earlier, went from 81 to 85% people that are willing to recommend Samsung. We're still a top 100 employer in Canada, we're a top GTA employer, and we're one of the number one employers for youth in the Canadian marketplace. So I think the way we tackled and challenged the situation allowed us to achieve some of these milestones. Was there a pivotal moment, or was there one moment that you were most particularly, when you sat back and reflected on all of that, most proud of, or, or a team, or, or a group of individuals? Yeah, that's great. Um, I guess the way I, I, I really, the, the one moment that, that always sticks in my mind um, was after the, the second recall. So I actually went up on Friday before a weekend to meet with Transport Canada, to talk to Transport Canada about lifting the band about Note 7, because we had found a solution, we knew what the root cause was, uh, we have a, a, a a software load that will go on the device that will change the battery to green, making, telling the flight attendants and the pilots that it's a good battery. But the day before I went up uh, was the situation with the Southwest Airlines flight in the, in the United States. So um, I clearly had to go up and, and basically tell the, the minister, uh, Garneau, that, you know what, I, I really can't, in all conscious, ask you to lift the ban. Um, I will give you an update. I gave them an update on the situation and all the things that we were doing as a company. And I think, you know, walking away from that and the way the federal government actually applauded us and Health Canada met with Health Canada that day as well. And they said, you guys are doing an amazing job on a recall. Usually recall rates in Canada are around 23%. Our recall rate, we got 94% of all devices back inside the Canadian marketplace. So I, I, I stand behind that as kind of one of the proudest moments, not for me personally, but as us as a team. Awesome, and that's what it's about as a company, right? So, specifically, as a, as, as a leader, you know, I, I've been given the, the opportunity to lead a group of people, and I think leaders' job is to inspire people, to bring the best out of people, especially in conflict, situ conflict situations. It's easy to manage through positive times. It becomes much harder to lead through tough times. Yeah. And so, speaking of tough times, Holger, um, what are some of the challenges, the top leadership challenges that you're facing today? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. It, the one thing I'm always amazed about, everything changes, social media is uh, everywhere, and uh, the progress on technology is obviously impressive, and, and the topics change. The one thing which hasn't changed is how you recruit people. It's still the traditional interview, and you sit with them for 45 minutes, for an hour, and then you need to figure out, are you gonna you know, join and move in with that person? And you know, try that in your personal life, right? Uh, interviewing somebody, and then deciding you want to live with that person is a, is a, is a really a tough call after an hour. And so I, I find that hard that there is no innovation uh, in, uh, in interviewing and finding the right talent. And today, everybody has figured it out. Everybody wears brown shoes and fancy socks and has a polished LinkedIn profile. And, and the headhunters, you know, they have access to LinkedIn like everybody else. So I find finding talent is so much easier. 
but selecting the right talent is so much harder. And and uh, when you when you have somebody move into your um, your place as a as a tenant, and you find out only a week in that they leave their hair everywhere in the sink, and you know, there's crumbs in the kitchen, and and those things you cannot find out in an interview. So I find it really challenging, not scoping talent but to really tell apart in a matter of an hour or two, which is still how we recruit today uh, around the world, and to filter out who, who's a good fit. And, and, and so that, that I still struggle with that. There's no, nothing better out there. So you're leaving us there? I, I, yeah, it's well, just the challenge, opinions. that's all Welcome. you got? No, we have some ideas around how to, uh, to improve it. I mean, at, uh, you know, at AAP, but I think still that we are very much like everybody else. We do, uh, you know, 360 interviews, we do different rounds, and. We do um, psychology tests and, 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 and as a cognitive test, et cetera, but, but I still find that there should be something better out there. So it's really, a, and I'm not uh, pretending we have uh, figured it all out. I do believe it is the strength of leadership as well to not always admit, uh, hey boss, I have a solution. It is quite okay not to have a solution and, and ask the broader team to, uh, to help and, and, and solve problems together because I do believe there's a lot of problems left in this society which we collectively need to solve and not just one strong leader. Um, so that's how I leave it. So there we go, fair enough. And so Andre, talk to us a little bit about your world. What are some of the most important decisions that, that you make as a leader for your organization? Well, clearly the, the, the worst decisions were my approach to dating, because I think Holger de demystified why a lack of success in university on dating interview <laughs> process was definitely not the right approach. I'm still um, single, man. I'm yeah. single and <laughs> hoping, hoping. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, um, to, to some of the, the, the things that we do around uh, the uniqueness and, and, and also around our approach, you know, I think one of the things that are very important around leadership and and how we go about it is really focusing on people's strengths and their per, you know how what they sort of uh, have core strengths around and what are those some some of those attributes that that we do and in terms of the decisions that they make around those strengths and you know I can touch a little bit on that but these decisions and how we allocate um, time is probably the most important thing and when you when you look at, at a team and you understand their strengths and you look at time is the most valuable thing as leaders that we can use as a tool, how much time do you spend on a priority? How many people are in a meeting? How much time is being consumed by all these individuals? And if you lean in on people's strengths of where their capabilities are and you kind of refine that element of time, you can get very quickly to, um, to what you know, the task is at hand and make sure that they're aligned on priorities. A couple other things that I think have been instrumental, uh, in my opinion, have been around one would be readiness. So individuals, what are their capabilities? Um, how, how are they in terms of skills and learning and development and being able to, their aptitude towards being able to deliver on, on some of those. So the decision around trying to prioritize you know, what, what training and simplify it, making sure that that's aligned with, with building those core strengths. And then the last one would be how, to, how the organization is oriented. So coverage and collaboration. What are the things that we're doing to align uh, individuals to make sure we deliver a best value to our customers? What are the th how do the different teams interoperate? And so see, the, all these three groups of decisions all orient around the strengths of an organization and being able to kind of maximize them, make sure it's, it's oriented and covered towards the right way for, for customers, and then make sure that we're prioritizing the right things from, a t from an element of time. So how often do you prioritize, or more importantly in our world these days, reprioritize? What's, what's the process? Can you walk us through that? Well, I, I think uh, that, that is uh, iterative constantly. And, and, and so I think you, you have some overarching priorities that are, you know, we, in our organization, Dell EMC, we talk a lot about the great eight. And we've focused around eight core pillars in driving some technology transformation. And we, and, and we deliver them using four messages around digital, IT, security, and workforce transformation. And so we have a, a, you know, an approach to helping customers solve technology needs. I think that applies also from a leadership perspective in terms of having some overarching goals for individuals. How do you, what are their aspirations? This comes back to that, leaning in on their strengths, making sure that you know kind of what a, uh, an employee is aspiring to do. And then, and then revisiting those on a regular basis. We have uh, very similar to what's been described. We have you know, 360, we also have uh, performance evaluations over time. 
um, but also we have a, a culture of one-on-ones where you can get engaged with individuals and understand the progress that they're making and understand you know, how they're tracking towards their goals. Wow, so really quite an evolution then, considering where you started. That's right. Wow, okay, so, so Holger, talk to me a little bit about what's the one thing that you did early in your career that was critical to getting you where you are today? What's your secret to success? Yeah, no, yes. She Again, was probably a million different socks. ways. What I, what I did is when I was young, I was a vacuum cleaner pretty early on in my career to a, a fairly senior executive. And, you know, I, I had to clean up all his mess. There was a litigation, you fix it. There was a, you know, restructuring, you fix it. And there was a cost saving, you fix it. So it gave me a good exposure really early on on, on broader corporate matters. And some of them, which you don't learn in university, it's all just that, you know, organizational tensions and little frictions and animosities, all of those things you don't learn in business school and in engineering school. Uh, so I found that helpful. The other thing I found helpful, um, just going international, I, 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 well, obviously you can tell my accent, I grew up in Germany, and then you're in for a treat when a German comes along, you know, with the fun and the humor. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, but, uh, you know, I traveled a lot. I was in the U.S. and uh, it, it just opened my, my, uh, my radar really early on in the career that there's significantly more than, uh, than Europe and, and Germany. So I, I think that is helpful, particularly early in your career, to just appreciate how, how big the world is. So how does ADP manage that then? Um, you talked about LinkedIn profiles. If anyone checks my note, they know I'm an ex-ADP employee. I'm not sure you knew that or not. I, I knew that, 2000 to 2005, and I looked at your old performance reviews. <laughs> and, and my previous boss is in the room here as well. We, we, we both take some steps since then. So. And I also told him if he's not nice with the questions, I cut his payroll off today. <laughs> so, um, but ADP is known for, for bringing in uh, different leaders from other countries. And so can you talk to us a little bit about that as Canadians? What are the opportunities for us to learn from international players? You know, I, I'm probably the, the worst to comment on that. Uh, on my current experience as ADP, I was with very international firms before, Siemens and ATOS and uh, European-based large corporations. But right now, ADP is a very North American-focused company still. Um, you know, a lot of our businesses here, so I, I think uh, uh, certainly uh, Andre and and, and Paul, who are currently with very multinational corporations, are in a great position to comment on that as well. But, but we do believe that um, a long-term sustainable advantage is to, to have capabilities globally and deliver payroll globally, which is still a really hard thing to do. So we try to focus on that, and we are looking for talent, which is not just incubated in the North American environment, but is able to handle business in, in Asia and understand payroll in Sweden and other places to really get it right and to get human resources technology right for the future. Paul? I, I mean, the thing that I'd add on to that is it's, at Samsung, we've actually started a lot more diversification. So we have a lot more corporate vice presidents inside the company who are non-Korean, right? So uh, Samsung is not like a traditional IBM. You went in there for life and you, you left after 30 years of service. What we started to do is interject people who have different experiences into the organization because um, you know, the world is not what it was 30 years ago and it continues to evolve. And if you, if you maintain that sort of thought process from a leadership standpoint, you will continue down that path. So uh, Samsung has deployed, we've brought in people from packaged goods industry, outside of um, traditional IT, cosmetics, other people to bring in an, a level of expertise. And I would have to say it's been a catalyst for changing us. If you think of Samsung, it was always known as kind of a fast follower as a company from a technology perspective. Now we're kind of an industry leader and an innovator. We actually innovate more than even some of our largest competitors in the marketplace. And a lot of that was driven by external people coming into the organization as well as creating a brand. So especially on the mobile side of the house, it's traditionally been years ago you'd ask somebody in Canada, what phone do you have? They'd say, I have a Rogers Bell or Telus phone. Now you ask them what phone they have, it's like a badge of honor. I have an S8, I have an iPhone 10, or I have an LG uh, device. So manufacturers have moved from the back room to the front room, and I think that was the catalyst which drove the success of Samsung through, through uh, 2000 and up until this point in time is we moved to create a brand around our products across the board. And we have a very simple philosophy as a company. We want to be number one or number two mm -hmm. in any market we play. If we can't be number one or number two, there's no economies of scale to that at the same time. We've also started to acquire companies outside of Korea. 
So in Canada, the employee base here is almost 1,000 people. Of the 1,000 people, probably about 500 are focused on the Canadian uh, landscape. We've acquired companies inside of Canada. We have an R&D facility out in Vancouver that focuses on security on mobile devices. We bought a company in Bedford, Nova Scotia, which is Halifax, those of you not from the East Coast, um, which actually focuses on rich communication services. We've acquired a company in Montreal called AdGear. We acquired a company in Waterloo called PrinterOn, and most recently we've ordered, opened an AI lab in Montreal. And the intent of the company is to have these parts of our business work on the global good of our technology, but keep them in their local markets, mm -hmm. because you don't just acquire the technology, you actually acquire the people. And if you start moving people from Canada to Seoul, it will have a definite different impact on those individuals. And as a result, we keep and we incubate these, these uh, sites around the world. And it's not just a Canadian phenomenon, although we probably over-index because Canada is recognized as a technology innovator now uh, globally. But I think it drives diversification inside of our company, which was largely a Korean-driven uh, culture inside of Samsung. Yeah, I just, I, I just would, sorry, hold. just one word on that. I, I do like to back to differ on the um, leadership and technology and Canada associated with that. I, it, it is a big frustration I hold. And while I grew up in Germany, I'm all Canadian. I have a Canadian passport. I, I'm deep rooted here and I, I, I love ca uh, Canada for all of it uh, stands for. But I do believe we are not strong enough recognized as a technology leader. And in fact, those few technology success stories we have getting sold to American powerhouses in most cases. So I, Korean maybe some of them as well or, or European. But, but I do believe there is leadership lack of technology uh, as a whole, as a, as a known brand, innovator brand. I, I think that's an area where, um, where Canada has a really huge room to grow. And, and, and I, I, while I wish we would be there, I, I unfortunately don't see us quite there yet. So, so we won't have a good old Canadian Donnybrook. I'll let you go. You know, I don't know. I, I, I checked. He doesn't have a Blackberry in his pocket, so he's good. <laughs> that's great. Well, hey, you know what? I think, uh, Holger, one of the things that we're very focused on is helping Canadians start to transform around. And we've got a great customer story with Nature Fresh Farms who is doing amazing things around using Internet of Things and measuring the, you know, the, how much nitrogen and moisture is in the soil. And these are, they, they are now exporting that technology of building you know, how, how long um, you know, peppers last on the shelves. They measure everything using technology, and they're now exporting that, that technology. So we're, we're certainly helping, trying to help our customers uh, you know, kind of uh, enable that as an approach. Um, but we do recognize that absolutely the Canadian um, uh, technology industry has lagged a little bit relative to the, the world. Um, you know, I just wanted to touch on the diversity aspect. I think there's, a, there's definitely an element that uh, both Holger and Paul described that's really critical around this value of diversity and having a, you know, a cross-section of different backgrounds and understanding. But in order to do that, you have to measure diversity as well. You have to look at are you getting... Uh, cross-section uh, that represents, you know, society in terms of the types of, of recruitment. And, and, and Holger talked about the difficulties of recruiting that we, we have, we've still used the same tools. We have to expand beyond that to make sure, you know, women in technology is an area where we have uh, um, Dell Women Entrepreneurial Network that we've launched and we, we really are trying to make more of a presence around getting more women involved in technology because there's been a lack of representation um, in, in our industry. Generally, it's been more male dominated and we want to make transformation. So you got to value diversity and you got to measure it to, to, to increase uh, the ratios. And diversity is huge, though, so, so it's not just women in leadership itself, but how do we enable women to advance in, in the organizations? What are some of the things you're doing um, with that initiative? Is there anything specific that we can learn about um, well, for how to get better? Well, we, we certainly, I think what we do is we look at, at kind of how the, um, the, the organizational charts and where we, we indicate kind of where we have some room to improve on diversity. We make sure that we have representation when we are recruiting or across different groups. We're also getting involved in events like, like this one, where we can you know, get a, a message out where it's not just our own hosted events, where we're now participating as part of a community. And once you start to participate in a community, and it's certainly social as well as in, in this community from a leadership perspective, you start to build a brand identity that you can then um, start to put uh, you know, sort of plant ideas. We also have, um, you know, a, a program at a university to make sure that we have interns coming in to help, uh, you know, improve, have different perspectives. Uh, millennials have uh, un uncanny ability to bring projects to a much more rapid state and kind of these skunk work projects that can and, and bring new ideas and new technology. And we're seeing different diverse 
um, ideology and, and, and different minority groups also come emerging from those as, as potential recruits in the future. I mean, this, this is so promising because as a gay man hosting this panel, I, I can't not acknowledge the fact that we do have, at the Art of Leadership, a non-diverse panel. Right. So what are your organizations doing to impact and change that? I can, I can take that one for you because I actually have a very diverse or executive team in, in Canada. So uh, interestingly enough, 40% of the people on our senior management team are women. And, and I actually had Sorry, a... Sorry, what's the percentage again? 40%. 40%. We're getting there. And, and we have uh, a gay man as our CMO as well. So Fantastic. We're, we're incredibly diversified as an organization. Um, what's really interesting is I've had senior executives inside of our company actually say to me, you've done a great job hiring women. And what I actually said back to him is I said, no, I've done a great job hiring people. Uh, um, and I think there's, a, there's unfortunately a stigma where we deliberately try to go out and hire women to fill positions. I think we should be looking for talented people uh, regardless of gender, gender or sexual orientation. And um, we have a, an unbelievable management team and I think that's what's driven our success inside the Canadian marketplace because of that diversification because we all think differently mm -hmm. and we all bring different perspectives to any challenge in the business world. And, and Holger, you and I were talking before as well about, um, you know, no one succeeds without a successful team. So, so how do you take a good team and then make it great? Well, first you need to create a good team. I, I believe that's the starting point. And um, you need to check your team, really. Are they aligned? Are they as passionate with the direction where you're going, right? If, if, if that is not happening, the team is not cohesive. So I, I, you, I think that is a condition for success, that everybody is really passionate, going in the same direction. And, and, uh, and you lead along. I, I do encourage, though, the leaders of teams um, to not just walk in front of the team and lead the team, but go behind it and take a really good look at the team. And, and that's what um, but I, my, my role, I see it really very much so, is I make sure my team is well. Um, that, that's what I focus on a lot, and taking a good look from uh, behind and just see how they're progressing, how they're working together, and, and are they cohesive? And, and that is really my, my role as a leadership, to, uh, to, uh, to observe and, and uh, help and coach and assist and, and assemble a, a team which is as passionate about the direction we are going in. And because I, I don't believe that the time should be wasted within ourselves fighting. And, you know, there needs to be obviously healthy friction, but I, I do believe it needs to go forward and, and not, uh, you know, spinning within the cycles. And therefore, it needs to be a team which sincerely likes to be together. And, and if that is not the case, then... Uh, I think adjustments uh, to the team are, are helpful to the, to the broader good. Yeah, pa passion's got to be critical if we're going to get any results yeah. at all. Uh, Andre, you've, t you've talked about you know, unique things that you do to really get the most out of your team. Right. What are some of those things? Well, I think what's important is to look at kind of where people, I mentioned the strengths, but I think part of that is also making some conscious choices around, you know, I, I know for myself, I don't spend any effort or time or energy worrying about blind spots or development opportunities or things. I find that the, the amount of energy to compensate for those things often is sort of counterintuitive. And, and also I think there's a cultural element which really ties in nicely to a lot of the discussion that we've had, which is if you can get a, a series of small wins within an organization and focus, put people in situations where they, they can succeed, then I, I'm a big believer in success begets success. My, my, I have two children, twin boys with disabilities, and I, every day they face uh, challenges that they have to overcome. And so if you can put them in situations where they have an attitude that they can overcome adversity, um, you know, I think at that point they, they have such a winning attitude and, and appreciation. And I, I think when you sort of look at, I've been at, at Dell EMC for 17 years, and we walk into my boss's staff meeting, and we look at the cross-section and I think it's, it's like 60% women. So, so I, I completely agree with Paul that successful organizations have a balance um, within, within the representation. But, but I, I myself personally have either been involved in helping, contribute, coach, develop, you know, five individuals that are across, sitting across from me. I think to me, measure of, of what the culture is and, and, and really valuing that diversity and engaging in people's strengths and core has kind of helped bring a lot of those individuals that I see across the table. And I think that's a big source of pride for us as an organization. Congratulations.
Thank you. And uh, so it, it is interesting that you, you know, you're talking of your children and we, we discuss disabilities. And, and I prefer to think of unique abilities rather than disabilities. But, yeah, I like uh, that. Yeah, let, let's see what we can do to really let the strengths shine through and, and help develop in areas where they choose to, to focus and do things slightly differently. Um, Paul, you've been able to forge uh, and cultivate the right partnerships to, to really keep Samsung brand sort of top of mind. What are some of those opportunities? So, I, I, I mean, in the Canadian landscape is probably one of the most unique landscapes in the world, as I keep reminding my, uh, my friends in Korea that it's the single largest landmass with the least population. Um, and it's important that you have partnerships. And if, as you imagine, we have a very diverse portfolio of products, from mobile phones to TV to home appliance to large format displays. We play in all segments inside of this marketplace. So one of the things that I learned early on in my career when I worked in the IT business was it's important to have strong partnerships and have respect from your partners and vice versa to respect your partners. So I, I, part of my job every day is to encourage the team to go out and forge those partnerships, which allow us to be successful. So working with them, uh, and it's an old adage, win-win, but, but it, it, there is some truth to it. If both organizations feel they're accomplishing some good together, then you tend to work in a much stronger atmosphere. Uh, and we have that across not only uh, our TV business, but in our carrier business with all the carriers in the Canadian marketplace and retailers across the board. And now we're forging new relationships with, with uh, players in the online space where we traditionally would sell through book, uh, uh, brick and mortar um, organizations. And we ourselves are forging new relationships. We've opened, uh, Canada is actually one of the uh, countries in the forefront of actually starting our own Samsung retail strategy. So we have five stores in the Canadian marketplace. We're about to open a flagship store at the Eaton Center, about 22,000 square feet. We have an on online strategy. So we're, we're not trying to comp compete with our partners. We're trying to complement our partners. And if you look at the way consumers uh, buy today, some want to engage directly with the manufacturer and some want to engage directly with partners. So our stores are called experience stores. It's not about coming and you can buy, but it's about coming in and experiencing Samsung. And somebody mentioned earlier, you know, the internet of things, and, and that's a big philosophy for us. As I was, we were talking today at lunch, and it's, it's confusing. I mean, my kids will embrace the internet of things, but um, my wife still has cold sweats when I tell her I want to connect something in the house to her phone. And I think these stores allow us to bring that together. So creating those partnerships with the right partners in the marketplace ultimate leads to your success. Mm. Holger, you talked about leaders setting the tone for performance and culture, and we've heard some of our speakers talk about culture today um, in your organization. With that in mind, what behaviors must leaders exemplify to, to really inspire performance-driven organizations? Yeah, I, I believe um, punishment doesn't work, right? So I, I hope we, we all figure that out at this point. Um, so the, the role of a leader is really to, to encourage and to try, and then, and in, in that environment, uh, I, I do believe it is, um, and I think I said it before. It is important. It is okay not to know, and and if uh, you know every time something is not going right, and you pound on on your particular subject matter expert, and you're gonna come up with a solution. You all heard those lines across here. You gotta have a solution, not questions, and. I, I think you're putting the onus on somebody who sincerely may not know, and he comes with so, so solutions which sincerely do not work. And so I really believe that a, a culture of, uh, of success is, is one of, uh, it is okay to make mistakes, it is okay not to know, and is one of encouraging, uh, in, incentivizing success as opposed to punishing, um, you know, obviously failures. I, I think that is a, a very um, key ingredient uh, to, to a successful culture. Wow. Um, Paul, did you have something to add yeah, to I was, was going to add, so uh, Samsung as a, as a company has traditionally had a senior methodology. Uh, if you read the book, The Outliers, there's a great chapter in there about Korean airline pilots, where Korean airline pilots, the, the, uh, the lieutenant would never challenge the captain, and they had many accidents where they flew into mountains, because in the culture of, of Korea, the most senior person, whether it's age or tenure, has all the answers. Uh, and that's been a real big challenge for us to change, to the point where I have a poster in my office um, which refers to letting your juniors um, actually shine and shine through. And I think one of the things you do that is, is experience isn't always the best uh, teacher, but I've, I've gauged myself to be a mindful thinker now. 
So when I'm in meetings with my team, I allow them to drive the conversation because it's easy for me to jump in and give a solution all the time, which I believe is right, which may not necessarily be right, but through absorbing and just listening and then coaching afterwards allows people to really showcase their skill sets and allows them to drive. And as you mentioned earlier, making mistakes is okay. Mm -hmm. I referred to it earlier in the note seven. We made a lot of mistakes, but that's the only way you learn and people become better leaders inside of your organization. We challenge people in our programs to open their weekly meeting with, as a, as a leader, admitting the biggest mistake I made in the last week was, and think about the impact that that has on our culture. Because as little kids, we learn when we broke mom's favorite vase, we quickly learn to hide mistakes. Um, we have probably all had to let someone go, fired somebody. And I think that whenever we let somebody go from our organizations, we learn out very quickly a week or two later that things were way worse than we ever imagined. And so when we begin these weekly meetings as a leader to just admit the biggest mistake I made last week was and let our people know that we're open to making those admissions. Uh, but I think the more important discussion comes right after when we then start to talk about, and here's what I learned from that mistake. Uh, we then begin to create that learning culture rather than a culture that's afraid of mistakes. Um, we, we learn that it's, it's okay and that we do need to change. So Andre, coming to, to your question, what, what role does leadership play when it comes to change. Well, I'll just reference back to something Paul said, because I think it was a really important ideology, and he talked about buckets and breaking problems down when there was a, a, an element, which is a problem statement. And I think, you know, from a Dell EMC, you can imagine two large organizations, th tens of thousands of people coming together and integrating two cultures that where there could be some redundancy, there's some fear and uncertainty around people uh, having a job. And, and the element of change playing is really on the other side, is what's the outcome, right? not knowing what the outcome. And, and the reason I like the, the bucket analogy is because from a success factor in Canada, we really focused around what were the, the elements of change that were really tied to that one individual. Let's not worry, there's sort of the controllable and uncontrollables, right? And so work, worry about the controllables, and then worry about the ones, turn it around and make it about the employee or the individual. Here's what's changing for you. And once you start to get people uh, more comfortable with some of those concepts and breaking down to smaller problems and only what, um, you know, the elements of change that will affect them, it's amazing how much, uh, you know, closer they get and how quickly they adopt and get on board. And what we saw was a tremendous cultural shift in Canada where, where people just absolutely got on board around the transformation that we went through. Where to, and, and I think many people have experienced kind of organizations getting together and having to go through some of that change. And some of them go well, some of them don't. So to, to hear um, the success of, of these types of transformations where the sum of the parts, one plus one, is more than mm -hmm. two, I think those are some of the stories that we can use where we can sort of find leadership opportunities. Amazing. Well, I'm going to come out to the audience in just a moment, so start thinking about what questions you'd like to ask our, our panel here now. But, Paul, I'm going to go to you for one last question from the stage. How important is it for companies to think beyond the profits uh, and lead by example with good corporate culture and citizenship? Yeah, I, and I think it's incredibly important to have your employees not only engaged in the day-to-day -day from a revenue perspective and profit perspective, but what, what matters to them socially. So inside of our uh, Samsung, we have a benevolent program that allows you to donate $400 and we'll match that $400. We went out as a company and uh, surveyed the employees and asked them what is most important to them. And as a result of that, we've become very active with sick kids here in Toronto. Uh, we've made a $2 million donation that will materialize over the next couple of years. We've taken our technology and brought it into that, that hospital to allow for um, not physical healing of the children, but mental healing of the children, and for family members that are in there at the same time, because it's a very traumatic situation. We've also become very active in STEM research here in the Canadian marketplace, where we have uh, schools across Canada compete, and we donate uh, technology to those schools to advance STEM and ultimately Holger help with the innovation inside the Canadian marketplace as part of that goal. And then lastly, um, uh, autism. So we are a big supporter of autism in the Canadian marketplace, taking our technology and allowing kids with autism to interact with their parents or their caregivers through a tablet and allow that to be their communication form. And it's, it's really had a positive impact on our organization. And if you look at people's pride to work with Samsung, this is one of the things that they point to, is the fact that as a large corporation, it's important for us to give back. And as a management team, we have one 
real guiding principle. As much as we're part of a Korean multinational company, we want to be recognized as a Canadian company doing business in Canada of Korean origin, not necessarily a Korean company doing business here in Canada. And it's the subtlety of that by making sure your employees are engaged and feel that they're uh, involved in all of the decisions we make and about socially giving back inside of this country. Thank you, panel. I appreciate your candor with me and your honesty. Do you want to find out what they have? Would like to know? Sure. Check it out. Where am I going? Who's got questions? Thank you. While well, we're looking for a question, maybe I can add, it's okay to make mistakes. It's not okay to make the same mistake a couple of times. I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> Um, so each one of you has a very different perspective on leadership, but you all seem very in tuned with how your leaders are managing their teams. My question is, how do you stay engaged and connected with your leadership team to ensure that that same uh, style of management is working its way down to their teams? Well, I, I can take it first. Uh, it's uh, very simple. You, you know, stay in good dialogue. It is you can't uh, manage if you don't talk, and uh, so it is very important to stay in touch and and feel out. You know, where the passions lie, and do you subscribe to the same value principles? And and if you have that comfort, and and you sincerely like working with each other, I do believe it is a condition uh, for a very sub, um, you know engaging uh, environment. Uh, the odds are you you find people. Um, you know, they just carry the weight uh, on your behalf. So it, it, is, it is really that harmony, the balance, which needs to exist, and, and you need to show some sincerity and weakness in, in opening that door. So I, I do believe that is the trust you need to have uh, to manage successfully. Yeah, I, I, the one thing I would maybe look at as well is, I think you mentioned around having the same style of management, and I, what I would just sort of look at that is say, is it the same uh, style of management that works for all of us in the room? Are, do we all lead in the same way? And there are variances that might be play into the strengths of the individual. I, there are some people who are great at, at identifying talent and being able to onboard. And if they're put in that position to help make the team better, and, and their style or approach is a little different. So what I would just invite is exploring some of those differences that break out of your shell as well and make the team a much more complete and, and, and uh, different perspectives and different points of view to help expand the, the, the success of the team. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is I, I have a couple of team members here today and they'll tell you I'm a big fan of the pop-in. So as they're having team meetings, I'll just stick my head in and, and interrupt them. And it's not in a disruptive way, it's just more of a trying to engage. And, and I have a very simple philosophy. The people I work with are like my family. So it's important for me to understand them personally uh, without prying and I'm trying not to make them feel uncomfortable because Today, we spend a lot more hours at the office than I think traditionally we would, did. So having an understanding of who they are as an individual and what drives and motivates them, I think is very, very important. And then, then I clearly engage in one-on-ones with, uh, with my teammates ever afterwards because some of them are, uh, want a lot more involvement, some want less involvement, and it's, and it's finding that comfort zone for both you and that individual so that you have kind of that symbiotic relationship that allows you to drive the success that you want and not one size fits all. Panel just off to your left, here on your left. Hi. Um, I wanted to, it's a little bit of a tangent, but when you said you didn't feel that Canadian uh, technology was being as innovative as maybe it should be, and there's first disagreement and then agreement in the end, I guess I see that the AI community in Toronto and Montreal is actually one of the best in the world. The blockchain guys are, actually, are doing some amazing things and are going to re revolutionize the world. They're fast-tracking visas for tech people, they're bringing them back from Silicon Valley. So I just, I guess I'm curious in what other ways you want Canadian tech to be innovating. 
Yeah, no, it's an excellent point, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you are raising that question. And my, uh, my comment does not uh, pertain uh, to the particular individuals on not being as uh, technology engaged in competence. And in fact, the University of Waterloo and other uh, great schools in the country have uh, great talent, and that uh, talent uh, is, is as smart as any other place in the world. What I'm mostly speaking about is the ownership and the incubation of the growth to make it a global relevant technology. And that is something where uh, in my flavor, too much uh, of that knowledge is still morphing towards that big dream working for a Silicon Valley kind of company. I, I'm really criticizing more the Canadian entrepreneur than the actual tech talent uh, to make it really matter to the world and, and uh, take brands uh, and, and make them scale in a, in a phenomenal way. And, and you heard this morning from Cirque du Soleil, a fantastic story, taking it to a place where uh, Cirque du Soleil is, is, is one of the most uh, prominent global brands in the world, and, and, but it's one in very, very, very few. There is not enough global um, brands, uh, companies, ownership, where Canadian innovation uh, really dominated a space. And BlackBerry had the makings of it. They unfortunately didn't make it. That's what really I was alluding to. I, I speak to the Canadian entrepreneur in tech to really make it large and matter. And I'm afraid even companies like Shopify, which have a go right now, one day will be absorbed by companies like Amazon, et cetera. So I'm really asking for maybe that extra step, and, and I'm, I'm considering me part of that as well, the extra step, and hang on to that just a little longer, make it matter, consolidate, buy an American company, and, uh, and, and create something which is really special to Canada. Uh, Olga, your, your point's valid. I think that the way we've looked at it as a, as a corporation is, We've gone out and we've found companies around the world, and, and in fact, we found companies inside of Canada that have a really unique solution that fits into the overall ecosystem that we have. So I think in some cases, those companies, for them to scale, becomes just that much challenging because they're part of an ecosystem. So the, the philosophy simply for us, and you, know, you mentioned the AI lab in, in Montreal, or whether it's companies we've hired, the intent is to keep those com companies in this country and allow them to continue to grow and develop their technology and ultimately integrate it into ours. So we, we provide them with that scale and that capability while maintaining that entrepreneurial spirit because if, if you bring them to our digital campus in, in, in Korea, there are 60,000 people of which 30,000 of them are R&D engineers. They'll lose that entrepreneurial spirit because they'll get absorbed into the big machine. So the intent is whether it's Canada or whether it's uh, the UK or whether it's uh, you know Sweden, wherever that may be, to keep those companies in those markets, developing it, drawing upon the 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 uh, pool of talent. And as you mentioned, you know Waterloo and and that part of of uh, Canada has great technology assets that I would rather see here develop company, uh, companies or businesses or technology that we invest in to keep them inside this marketplace as opposed to migrating to Southern California or Northern California, excuse me. Panel right in front of you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, a bit of an abstract question. Workplace politics is always prevalent in any organization. And it seems like playing the game can often be as important as being good in your role or in your performance. So what practical advice could you suggest in navigating workplace politics, particularly in the context as someone wanting to climb the corporate ladder as an, as an ins aspiring leader? Well, I'll just uh, jump in and say one of the things that's been uh, really defining in the integration work that's been done is really identifying core uh, cultural values and uh, when, you, when you have a lot of transparency around the core cultural values that, that the organization has, then oftentimes, you know, the, those sort of political efforts or approaches tend to maybe not be as prevalent. There's a bit more transparency around what's accepted and what's not. And through the integration of both, you can imagine there was two sets of, of corporate values and all the employees were surveyed to understand kind of where where each organization was, and much to I guess our lack of surprise, the the uh, all of the stack ranking of the order of importance came out to be the same. Now, when both organizations came together, there were still some different perspectives on the spectrum 
around those cultural values, and we had to work through that. So what I would just say is the underpinning around uh, your question around you know, some of those managing some of the behavior and, and, and approaches would be make sure that they're the, in the background there was a very strong principles around corporate values that really underpin what is acceptable behavior, what's not, what is, what is accepted practice within a culture and what's not. Yeah, I would, I would add um, the role of a leader is uh, to integrate and not to pick a side. I, I think we can see in politics, and I'm sure Joe Biden has a piece to say about that, is what happens when you pick sides, right? And, and when you start to divide, and, and that is, uh, in, um, it may work in politics, it doesn't work so well in, in corporate environments. So I do believe leaders need to bring parties together. Uh, I'm probably not the best examples. We have absolutely no corporate politics at ADP whatsoever. So it is... Uh, <laughs> for me are really hard to comment on that now. But if, if you do spot those spaces, you know, get in the middle, try to bring sides together and, and assist in, in getting those frictions out of the system. I can tell you that we are in a, in a fairly long transition. We used to be a payroll company. Today, uh, half of our business comes from uh, HR outsourcing and, and, and HCM technology. And, and there is two camps in that company as well. And it's really to find the common denominators on why it is a better place together. And, and that is uh, what I think a leader is supposed to do. I think the only thing I'd add on top of that is a, a leader, it's, it, it's incumbent upon us not to condone that sort of behavior, right? Because uh, we're human beings as well, too. So people get drawn up into those situations, and you, you need to uh, terminate it the minute you see it happening. There are ways to formalize uh, what people call uh, politicking, and, and that's by creating kind of a formal mentoring program because what you see is a lot of people inside the organizations, and you see it today with millennials, right? Their patience level is zero, and they want to constantly be going through a change. So how do you open up yourself to having conversations with those types of individuals in a structured manner inside the company? Because what is potentially perceived as politicking is somebody actually just trying to advance and, and um, you know, showcase their capabilities and their talents. And in some cases, as a leader, I learn a lot more from three levels down than I do directly from people who work for me because their insight is much more uh, impactful and much more real today uh, and, and gives you some great information. Panel, just off to your right, your last question from the audience. He said I better make it good because it's the last one. Um, as a leader, a female leader in IT, no doubt, um, I found that my most growth moments have been when I've been put in an uncomfortable position. So I'd like to learn from you, have you been put in uncomfortable positions and can you share with us what you've learned from that? As leaders. Oh, okay. Take a crack at it. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify, uncomfortable position as leaders, okay. Um, you know, I, I, I remember my very first day at Dell and uh, you know, again, that sense of what, what Vince talked about, that sense of, you know, sort of tackling the world. And you go and you do that first report, and I thought, well, last week we were 170%. And then I looked at the side units, and it was like six units. We went to seven or something like that. And it was like negligible, not even existent, and it didn't even matter. And, and you, you get that humility of, of understanding that you're in that uncomfortable spot where you, you realize, and it's this play on consciousness and competence, right? When you walk into a job, you're unconsciously incompetent. You think, wow, they hired me, this is great. And then the, f the next stage that you go into is you consciously competent, uh, consciously incompetent. You realize, wow, I, you know, they, they, I don't know half the stuff that I'm supposed to know. And the next stage is consciously competent where you understand very quickly what it is that you need to do to be successful. And then the last stage is unconsciously competent. And it all starts with being in that uncomfortable position where you either take a leap from a role perspective or get in front of the room and, and do that presentation for that very first time and sort of recognize that moment. Do we have more time? Uh, well, just I would like to add to that, it is expanding your horizon. Be uncomfortable is a, is a great thing within means. And I do believe it is a great leadership test as well. Are you freezing? Or are you leading, right, in those situations? So I, I do encourage to, you know, expand uh, and test uh, the abilities of leadership by just creating some uh, structured discomfort. And uh, I, I like to do it. I spoke about the interviews. I, I do it in interviews. I ask uncomfortable questions just to see how people uh, deal with it. And um, so, yeah, I, I think it is an important thing to just expand horizons and, and see how far it goes. Uh, obviously, it needs to be within reason and not put somebody uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a very unsolvable uh, discomfort. 
I, I think the only thing I'd add just quickly on to the end of that is, is we're human beings, right? So if you have a sincere, genuine conversation, regardless of who you are inside the organization, um, it's okay to have an uncomfortable conversation as long as you're genuine while you're having it and, and uh, show a level of empathy as you're going through that situation at the same time. Because we're no different than the person that's having the conversation or the situation that you're in. We've all been in it at one point in our lives. So I think just being sincere and genuine allows you to get through those things. Panel, thank you so much. Your candor. Thank you. Are you bringing thank you. me up? Thank you. Your candor, your honesty, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Yeah.